Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I hope you're all taking a cheeky little break from your jobs. Um, I am thrilled to have such a stacked panel here to talk about the future of horror. Um, I'll go through intros and everything in a moment, but just wanted to thank Adrian and the FanFi Addicts team for putting together this wonderful con, this, you know, all virtual, all free, wonderful programming. I've just been thrilled to see it and I'm so glad you're all here. So uh, I'm Emily Hughes, I'll be moderating today. Um, I have worked all across the publishing industry uh, for the past dozen years or so. Uh, I was most recently the editor of tornightfire.com um, and I used to be the editor of Unbound Worlds, uh, if anybody remembers that site, RIP. Um, and I am thrilled to be here with five terrific horror writers and editors. Uh, I'm gonna go through just alphabetical order, make sure we get everybody. Uh, starting with Ellen Datlow. Ellen has been editing sci-fi, fantasy, and horror short fiction for over 40 years as the fiction editor of Omni Magazine and editor of Event Horizon and Sci Fiction. She currently acquires short fiction and novellas for Tor.com. In addition, she has edited more than 100 science fiction, fantasy, and horror anthologies, including the annual Best Horror of the Year. She's won 10 World Fantasy Awards, as well as an array of Locus, Hugo, Jackson, Stoker Awards, and has been given Life Achievement Awards by the HWA, the World Fantasy Convention, and the Carl Edward Wagner Award by the British, excuse me, British Fantasy Convention for outstanding contributions to the genre. She lives in New York and co-hosts the monthly Fantastic Fiction Reading Series at KGB Bar. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you. Gabino Iglesias is a writer, journalist, professor, and literary critic living in Austin, Texas. He's also the author of the critically acclaimed and award-winning novels, The Devil Takes You Home, Zero Saints, and Coyote Songs. Iglesias' nonfiction has appeared in the New York Times, the LA, the LA Times, Electric Literature, and Lit Reactor, and his rever reviews appear regularly in places like NPR, Publishers Weekly, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Boston Globe, Criminal Element, Mystery Tribune, Volume One Brooklyn, and the LA Review of Books. Welcome, Gabino. Zhui Ting Ni was born in Guangzhou, China, and emigrated with her family to Britain at the age of 11. After graduating in English literature from the University of London, she began a career in the publishing industry while also translating original works of Chinese fiction. Since 2010, Zhui Ting has written extensively on Chinese culture and China's place in Western pop media to help improve understanding of China's heritage, culture, and innovation, and introduce its wonders to new audiences. Zhui Ting has contributed to the BBC, Tor.com Publishing, and the Guangdong Art, Ac Art Academy. Her first book, From Quan Yin to Chairman Mao, is published by Wiser Books. Her British, British Fantasy Award uh, nominated an anthology Synopticon, a celebration of Chinese science fiction, came out in November 2021, and she's currently translating stories for Sinophagia, an anthology of Chinese horror fiction due to hit shelves in spring 2024. Welcome, Shui Ting. Thank you. Katrina Ward was born in Washington, D.C. and grew up in the U.S., Kenya, Madagascar, Yemen, and Morocco. She studied English at the Univ University of Oxford and later created a completed a creative writing master's at the University of East Anglia. Ward has won the August Derleth Award for Best Horror Novel three times for her debut, The Girl from Raw Blood, again for Little Eve, and a third time for The Last House on Needless Street. She's the first woman to, woman to win the Derleth Award multiple times. An international bestseller, her books include The Last House on Needless Street, Sundial, Little Eve, and the forthcoming Looking Glass Sound. Erica T. Wirth's debut novel, White Horse, was a New York Times editor's pick, a Good Morning America buzz pick, and an Indie Next Target Book of the Month and Book of the Month pick. She's both a Kenyan and Sewanee fellow, has published in the Kenyan Review, BuzzFeed, and the Writer's Chronicle, and is a narrative artist for Meow Wolf Denver. She's an urban native of, of Apache, Chickasaw, and Cherokee descent. She lives in Denver with her partner, stepkids, and two incredibly fluffy dogs. Welcome, Erica. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I want to jump right into the discussion. And uh, as I said before, I'm very happy for this to be a very free-flowing, you know, jump in, talk with each other, build on each other's points. You know, I think it's 
more more boring for both us and for the viewers if we're just doing a very strict question and answer. So I really want you guys to dig in and have a conversation. Um, so I think we should start with, since we're talking about the future of the horror genre, I think a great starting place would be what trends have we all observed in horror fiction over the last few years? Uh, let's see, Ellen, as a venerable editor, I would love to start with you. Okay, well, okay, there are a couple of different meanings of trends. Um, there's first the kind of the thematic trend, what kind of horror has been published lately, and I would say folk horror is very hot, gothic horror, and things like yeah. that. And also the trend of, to me, um, other voices coming into play. In the last five to 10 years, especially, mm -hmm. there are a lot more writers of color, writers from other countries and continents writing horror or being translated into English from, from their native language, from their original languages. And um, that to me is almost more, is more important than the trends of what the themes are. I mean, I guess it's, a, and I think because of those, the people who are newer people who, who are being heard now, we're also getting their own myths and their own legends and their own, it's a different, point of view of things that have been written in the Western countries for ages that we've been reading. And so I'm really pleased that we're getting those voices from other places. Absolutely. And, and Zhui Ting, you are doing uh, a, a lot of that translation of Chinese horror and sci-fi right now. So I would love to hear your take on this. Yes, um, I am seeing a similar trend as um, Ellen, um, that we're getting a lot of other voices into the genre, into the Anglophone um, um, horror publishing. Um, so as a Chinese culture writer and um, someone who works with translated fiction, so I'm going to be mainly talking about um, the horror genre in the China China's tradition. So over the previous decade, um, like two or previous decade, um, within the China, within China's horror tradition, um, I've been seeing a general flourishing of the genre, which um, actually has not been the case. It's not had a chance to um, flourish before, um, but has in the 21st century. Um, and especially uh, traditional kind of Stories, ghost stories in traditional spirit, uh, communi communing, um, and things like that. Um, and more recently, I'm seeing more social and psychological horror um, stories being published as um, the problems of a developing country, a developing society is coming more to the surface through um, social media and things like that. And also with the rise of the middle class and, and consumerism um, comes with it certain social issues that um, I see horror writers addressing. So these are the current trends I'm seeing in terms of Chinese horror at the moment. Now, do you think that, so you said uh, you've seen an uptick in social and psychological horror uh, on in the Chinese fiction world. Do you think that's, obviously you said that's a, that's partially because of a rise in consumerism, a rise in social media. Do you, how do you see those dovetailing with uh, English language equivalents of social horror and psychological horror? I think there are certain, oh, okay. yeah, there are certain commonalities in all human societies. Um, I mean, China at its current stage of development is quite similar to the West in the 1950s and also the 1980s. So you're getting um, uh, the rise of um, kind of urban centric um, developments in the uh, rise of middle class and therefore um, and also, you know, the, the capitalist consumerism coming into play. Uh, and so this is leading to all sorts of ethical issues um, and things that 
I think we can all relate to that perhaps in the West, we have gone through um, at, a, at earlier stages, but there are also some peculiarities that are unique to Chinese society. Um, and that's this side of um, the current horror development is what I'm trying to bring um, over to Anglophone readers in my translations. I'm very excited, very, very excited to read. I, I, someone had asked me uh, a year or two ago, you know, do you know of any uh, Chinese horror in translation? And there's just, a, as you well know, there's not a ton of it out there in the English language market right now. So I'm really excited for your anthology. Thank you. There isn't, there isn't, uh, there's hardly any contemporary Chinese horror out there at the moment. And that's I'm hope, what I'm hoping to change. Fantastic. Now, Gabino, I know that you do a lot of reviewing, uh, including occasionally for me. Um, I would love to know from your perspective what trends you've been seeing. Uh, uh, I would say more. Uh, and I, we've covered uh, more diversity, more BIPOC and LGBTQ writers. But with that comes uh, a couple of really amazing things. Number one is more horror. So now we talk about horror, yeah. but... It's not rare to see comedy horror, erotic horror, political horror, uh, LGBTQ based horror. Like, you know, you have trans writers saying, let me show you my experience. Um, so we get more of everything. And with more of that comes um, more publishers. And that's awesome. So it's uh, fr from like the top big four, uh, whatever you want to call them, to micro presses, folks putting out horror chat books. Uh, a middle level indie presses uh, that have finally figured out how to do distribution really well. Um, so it's, it's, it's a wealth of horror. There's absolutely everything for everyone out there. Um, and I don't see it uh, stopping anytime soon. So hopefully the whole more thing will, will continue to go down that, that road. And uh, uh, the more we get, the more we enjoy. And there's something for everyone, which I think it's uh, it's beautiful. It's uh the days of, of uh, straight white men writing about their fear of the other are pretty much uh, <laughs> done. Like we're, yeah. we're, we're loud and, and folks are reading us. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying the ride. Right, the straight white men can still write those stories. We just don't yeah. have to read them because we are, are <laughs> spoiled for choice with so many other things. <laughs> Now, Erica, your debut novel just came out a few months ago. Um, congratulations, first off. And I want to know, as a as a, a relative newcomer to long form fiction publishing, what trends were you seeing, especially as you were writing White Horse? Well, I'm definitely not. Um, it's not my debut novel. I'm definitely not new to long form. I, I published. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I was a Two novels before this, but they were realism and they were um, the small presses. So um, yeah, but I'm a debut in many, many ways to the big five experience to, you know, you know, all the things I've sort of, you know, garnered through this book. And so I, you know, in some ways it, I do feel like a debut author. Um, as far as the trends go, I think as everyone's noted, um, there's obviously <clears throat> far more diversity, and I feel like obviously I'm part of that wave, and I hope I hope that doesn't go away. I think um, what's interesting is if you look at what Sylvia Moreno Garcia, who obviously you know she's somebody who's extremely well known now, even outside of horror communities, has talked about. She talked about the kind of death of horror in some ways, unless you're talking about Stephen King, that has you know that you know, all these writers are kind of masked as like thriller writers, right? And now you have this rebirth of horror. And I think that's kind of, as a, um, and it's just fun for me because it made me realize how much I missed my nerd roots and how much I wanted to, to get back to those things. Um, and I think for me, part of my weirdness as a writer is I'm literary, but I'm also horror, but I'm also crime. And so people kind of sometimes don't know what to do with me. And the fact that I'm indigenous um, creates a kind of a, another um, weird factor where it's like, are we learning a cultural lesson when we read these things? How authentic an Indian is Erica and how authentic an Indian book is Indian book? And all of that stuff, um, what I hope gets wiped away when you have, and I've been writing for years and years and years articles in Lit Hub or even BuzzFeed about how many native voices there are who write in different genres and different aesthetics. 
And I think um, it, it's a small crew, but you have <clears throat> uh, V Castro's an indigenous uh, Mexican writer. You have me, you always have Stephen Graham, Graham Jones. And I think a, a dude named Shane Hawk, I think is set to absolutely make his name. And so that's what's me is at least even in our tiny corner of the universe, um, all these things are coming to the fore, all these writers. And I think also there's, because of um, day and boarding schools, our stories, our um, traditional and spiritual life have been kind of squished and we've been told, don't talk about it. It's traditional not to talk about it. And we're kind of learning, no, that actually has more to do with the day and the boarding schools. And you have people like Rebecca Roanhorse um, writing brilliant dark fantasy, which is like, you know, next door to horror. Um, and you have different writers um, doing it in different ways in, native, in the Native world, and I, and I do love seeing that. So. We're thrilled to have you. And it's, you know, I, I love Stephen Graham Jones. I think we all, all love Stephen Graham Jones here, and it's nice that he's not the only option. Yeah. You know, we are, we are rich with choice. Now, Kat, you have, uh, you have published a, a huge number of novels just over the last few years. And I know a couple of them were previously published in the US, in the UK, excuse me. Um, I would love to hear what, you know, you, you kind of bridge the US and UK, and I would love to hear your perspective on that, uh, that balance. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because I think no matter who we are, or wherever we are in the world, we all went through in some form or other this kind of great global horror recently. Um, everybody had to go through, um, it's, I think coming to terms with your own mortality, I'm talking about COVID obviously, um, coming to terms with your own mortality, also being, I remember this um, hearing that there were two forms of um, two forms of writing here in the UK that really were, that were really like spiking in sales. And interestingly, the very, it couldn't be more different. One was the cozy, the cozy mystery. And the other one was the ghost story. And there's something, there's something in that those two things have in common, I think, um, whereby uh, they're both, they both, they're both transcendental. They both take you out of yourself and out of your lived experience. But I was particularly interested in the ghost story because there's a sort of push-pull attitude there towards, I mean, didn't we all feel like ghosts, trapped in one place, confined to a location, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, unable to leave our houses? Um, and yet there's, there's this sort of, like, this process of identification and, and, and also transcendence, which I think is kind of epitomizes what, what horror is and what, what it should be. Um, I think that... I don't know how these things work, but I feel like something about that seismic shift and that that moment in time may have helped open the doors to um, everyone realizing that they're not an island um, and that we need each other. And what is horror but a sustained act of empathy? You know, um, I, in terms of my books, you know, I I think horror has become much more ready to, from a publisher's point of view, much more ready to be non traditional. I think that my my first um, novel, um, The Girl from Raw Blood, was it was a very traditional horror novel. That's sort of what people were after. They wanted they wanted a, a format which everyone was comfortable with and readers knew what to expect. And, and that's don't get me wrong, that's part of the beautiful play that horror makes with its audience. Is it's it's this kind of amazing game of tennis where the readers are so familiar with the tropes and strategies, and 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 everybody has this collaborative act of creating the story together. So there's nothing wrong with a traditional storytelling you know, method, but I mean, like Gabino said, like it's just so exciting to have more. It's so exciting to have more stuff and more to draw from and more to, more to read. And I think that it's, it seems to have taken a really rapid um, kind of trajectory of diversification over the last two years, which is absolutely the consummation that we, we would wish for. And um, I wonder, I, I do wonder how much maybe us being forced to look ourselves in the eye for so long, or just at least look our own four walls in the eye, <laughs> as it were, for so long, had to do with perhaps opening up our, our psychic doors. I don't, I don't know. Um, I, do, I, do, I do think that horror has become, it seems to be much more ready to, um, for, to be accepted by the, by the mainstream 
uh, publishers as, as a sort of, because horror scene is a bit schlocky sometimes, it's a bit silly, it's for children, you're not supposed to be afraid of things, are you? You're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to be a grown up, you, you don't, you don't, you, you don't fear anything. This is something sort of a bit shameful about it, really. Um, and I think that's part of its power, is it speaks to the things we're, we're ashamed of. It speaks to the deep feelings that we don't acknowledge to each other. We only acknowledge to books. <laughs> um, so I, this is a very long winded, winded way of saying, I think, I, I, think, I think all the doors are slowly opening up, maybe not fast enough, maybe not, um, maybe not all at the same rate, but it seems to me that this is never, there's never been a more exciting time to, to, to write or to, or to read horror. Does anyone have anything they'd like to build on there? Or I can, I can keep going. I just don't want to monopolize. <laughs> well, I don't know. I have, there are people who won't read horror because they're afraid of it because it scares them too much. Yeah. <clears throat> and occasionally I've been asked in interviews how would you get someone to read horror if they don't? They think they don't like horror. I think it depends on what they think horror is and what horror actually is comprised of. You know, there are so many different types of horror that okay, maybe you're not going to like this thing, but you might like this. And if you like this author, then you might like this. But I don't think there are certain people who are never going to like horror because it scares the shit out of them, <laughs> and they don't like it. But it scares the shit out of me too. But we like, love that's it. the whole point but of it. Other people yeah. don't. I mean, I um, I, when I worked for Omni, we we had we did an interview with Clive Barker for our um, a book column, and the book column editor and I and Clive had lunch, and the book editor says, "I can't read horror; it scares me." And Clive and I look at it. Well, that's why we love it, you know. And you know, there are some people you're not going to change their mind, but you might be able to turn them onto things that are not as scary or won't hit the buttons that will turn them off. And I don't know how you do that. You, you kind of say, well, if you like this, you'll like that. But I also think it's a golden age for horror short fiction, definitely. I mean, there's so yeah. much being published and not only by horror venues. I mean, I look at FNSF, I look at Asimov's, I, you know, I look at a lot of different magazines. Most of them, many of them do not have any horror, but, but a lot of them do. Um, so you can't, you know, I try to turn readers on to the venues that they may not think actually contain horror, but will have horror. And writers who don't usually write horror or don't always write horror, but write a mix of things. And yes, Kelly Link writes horror sometimes. She yeah, does. A yeah. lot of it is dark and a lot of it is horror. Um, but how many horror readers know her name? Probably, a, I'd guess a small percentage because she's now pushed it mainstream. You know, I do think it's like what scares people and what they think horror is because I think that a lot of people are under the impression that horror is the slasher because that's so what the film is about. Yeah. And a lot of the movies have the movies but have they don't scare me <laughs> at all. They're kind of like gross. And they're like they don't and, scare and me. And yet, and yet it's those those same people are, are willing to watch Ned Stark get decapitated on Game of Thrones. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my boyfriend always, he's a thriller writer and whenever he comes in the room, he'll be like, what are you watching? And I'll be like, a good show. And he's mm. like, you know, watch that. It's an ad. Like he has had, you know, written and watched like all kinds of violence, but that doesn't scare me on a profound level or compel me. But I, I think that's what's interesting. Like what people think is for, what people will read, you know, why mm. they don't why they think some kind of scare is like okay for them to experience and why other scares no. Or even yeah. do you want to be scared or you do want a, a sense of unease? There are different reactions you have to different kinds of horror. So, do you think you have to be scared to write it though? I, I have to be scared not to write a writer, it. I can, I'll keep myself out of this. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Well, that's the know. question. I mean, I think horror doesn't have to be scary overtly and obviously what scares one person is completely different to what scares another person they're they're so person i mean I, I so chuck tingle is uh publishing his first traditionally published horror novel uh with tor nightfire this coming summer and obviously coming from an erotica background uh he talks a lot about this sort of you know horror gets looked down on in the same way as romance or as comedy and i think you know, Kat, what you were saying about, you know, 
it's it's considered childish to be scared. You know, you're not supposed to be scared. You're supposed to be able to get over it. And it's like, well, okay, why are we, if we take a step back and think, why are we looking down on genres that are explicitly made to make us feel something? We all feel, you know, fear that doesn't, that doesn't stop at a certain demographic border. It doesn't stop at a certain, you know, national border. Every human feels fear, right? Um, yeah. Every human, every human laughs. I it's, don't think there's... It, it's much more common than romance, for instance. Like not everyone will experience a perfect romance in their lives, but everyone will be afraid at some point. I think, you know, I, for example, I grew up with a lot of um, really abusive personalities and I was on Talking Scare the other day and I was saying, you know, I probably should be a slasher reader or writer and I'm not, it doesn't scare me. And it is interesting because if people know me, they know one of the things that I don't tolerate is like predatory behavior. And I actually have almost smashed my career over it. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a big thing for me. But I have to admit, um, that doesn't scare me. That makes me mad. And right. it's for the paranormal stuff or the cryptid stuff that it, it, it's a, it's intrigues me because it's like a portal to another world. And that's compelling rather than just like, ring, ring, you know, it just, it just, it's not the same thing, but why I work that way. I don't know. Yeah. I'm curious, Ellen, uh, what still scares you? after 40 years in this business? I always say real life. <laughs> I mean, reading yeah. rarely scares me. I mean, there, there are stories I've read and novels I've read and movies I've seen that I can't bear to, well, I can't, I, I watched, I saw The Thing when it first came out, the, um, the John Carpenter. I haven't been able to watch it since. And I really want to, but um, I have to say mutilation really gets me, you know, <laughs> and I have not been able to watch that again. Okay. Eventually I will. Um, so is that, does that scare me or just repel me? I mean, there's a difference. I think I'm repulsed by things. Does it actually scare me? I don't expect scares from horror. I mean, if sometimes they do, but usually it's something else. It makes me feel really uncomfortable. It makes me feel icky <laughs> um i'm creeped out but does but when you say fear does it make me think that something like this is going to happen to me usually not i mean you know obviously um psychological horror could um so i, I it's the way it's the it's the extreme unease i think more than fear that scared i i don't get scared i get I have other reactions to good horror. Is that a fact? That sort of <laughs> no. It's just, it's so interesting is because that, there's that thing of um, that Shirley Jackson thing, isn't there? Of she's never entirely convinced that real life isn't a worse option mm -hmm. than horror, you know, particularly for women. She's, she's, she's always got this slight reservation that maybe actually, um, <laughs> maybe, it, maybe, maybe it's the day to day that'll kill us. It is the day to day. Day. <laughs> well, um, at the moment, everyday life can be so kind of horrific that there is an appeal to reading a horror story and then living, being able to survive it and going through that process yeah. and coming out okay in the end. Um, but furthermore, there's all kinds of horror. There's the creepy ones, there's the ghostly creepy ones, there's the suspenseful thrillers, there's kind of jump horrors and then psychological ones and I think this probably might not be a point to horror if you don't if you're not affected in some way if you if you don't feel scared mm -hmm. or on a sense of unease um yeah so it's I'm certainly seeing kind of a kind of two trends at the moment one is um kind of a total escapism into the idyllic and then the other one is kind of into mm. the very dystopian into the <clears throat> horror um different types of horror um I think, oh, sorry so different kinds of horror stories i think for me most the scariest kind of horror combines the supernatural and the psychological you know how does the supernatural affect the people who are being affected and the psychological interactions from that 
supernatural element. Well, Gabino, uh, in The Devil Takes You Home, you have such a, a, a fascinating and expert blend of crime and horror. So there's there's thriller, there's intrigue. And I think that you know a lot of your work navigates that line really well. I would be interested to hear your perspective on, you know, because not, not everything in The Devil Takes You Home in particular is frightening in the same way. I would say that that's a book that contains uh, a number of different vectors to, to get right to the, the soft underbelly of the reader. Right. So I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Well, thank you for the kind words. First of all, uh, I could listen to those all day. So if you want to go on later, uh, you can call me, and, uh, tell me some more. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny because we're, we're talking about fear and, and there's also like being unsettled and, and being uncomfortable. Uh, I think we all, you know, we start out, um, I usually tell people I, I set out to write um, love stories because every story is at the end kind of like a love story, but uh, I can't and things just start going wrong and it turns into something else. Um, horror and crime are just perfect dancing partners because I get up in the morning and, and the things that I'm scared of, it's like, you know, the Supreme Court. Or what's Ted Cruz up to today? And how are we going to treat people? And how are we going to erase, you know, trans individuals? How are we going to take rights away from women? Um, so that makes me angry and it makes me fearful and it makes me uncomfortable and, and it makes me want to stab people. Uh, so I think <laughs> when we sit down and write, we can collect all of those things and go like, uh, I enjoy reading about vampires and ghosts and witches and werewolves and demonic possession and, uh, uh, Mutilation. I have a thing for mutilation, so I, I'll, I'll write a little bit of it, and I, I enjoy reading it too. Um, but then, <laughs> then we, we we turn around, and, and you're, you're talking about real life. So we talk about abuse and racism and poverty and sickness and and uh, uh, the way that we've built society and how our, our healthcare system is a piece of shit. Uh, and so those things also make me as uncomfortable as, as the rest. Um, and they're not as enjoyable. Like I, I'll enjoy gothic fiction and reading about the walls, you know, with, with uh, a green stuff on them. And I'll enjoy the, the transformation of a werewolf. I don't enjoy politics. I don't enjoy uh, uh, taking rights away from people. So when we bring those yeah. two together, it's like, here's the best and the worst uh, of both worlds. And uh, it's not for everyone. I think that the reason romance is so huge um, is because it doesn't matter what happens in the middle, you know that if you put up with it, you will 99.9% .9 of the time you get the happy ending. And so it helps you escape and, and it's beautiful and, and, and you feel their love. Um, with horror, you're sitting there at the, at the edge of your seat and there's a chance everybody will die. And so you're just, you're just holding on. You're like, who's going to get their heads caught off next? Who's going to lose everything? And the same with crime. We, uh, you start, you create these characters, you feel empathy, you connect with them. And then someone yeah. like me comes along and they're like, you'll really like that character, right? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, you know, it sticks with you. So, um, yeah, hopefully we get to do it a lot more. You know, it's interesting. I think a lot of it might have to do with where we start as readers. And I started um, as a fantasy geek. And I, I've said this before, but, you know, I remember <clears throat> my dad's family, one of them gave me a copy to, give, to kill a mockingbird. And I just remember being like, where are the dragons? You know, I just wasn't interested in any way. And so, um, and then it got, you know, and then I went to horror and then I went to sci-fi. And then when I went to college and then my PhD, they ironed that out of you. Like, especially at the time, they're like, that's just not quality literature. And I considered myself to be a smart person. And some of that more serious literature did speak to my more serious background. But I do think that what we want out of horror, because I want the dark portal to the other world. You know, I am so compelled and profoundly frightened, but compelled by those things. And I think it has to do with where I started. So I guess that's a, a curiosity right there. Where did people start? What was the first literature that people read? Um, you know, and I read widely, but it was, it was mainly fantasy. Um, and that, that'll give you a clue as to what scares us or compels us, you know? Yeah, I read a lot of horror growing up. I mean, I read everything growing up, but I, I read the myths, you know, 
Bullfinch's mythology, the Odyssey. I hated the Iliad. It was boring, but the Odyssey had monsters, <laughs> so I loved it. <laughs> um, Nathaniel Hawthorne's short stories. I mean, I didn't even realize until people kept asking that I actually grew up more on short stories and novels. Now, I loved Brad and later a little bit later as teen or preteen, you know, I read Bradbury and Matheson and Ellison and all these other great writers. Um, so I, I actually, and I love craft and I read science fiction and horror and even yeah. pot boilers too. Harold Robbins, <laughs> I admit to, but actually no one's probably even knows who he is anymore. <laughs> so yeah, I read it's everything, just... but I read the dark stuff too. I loved it. It's such a great, it's such a great point about short stories as well because I think that they they're sort of the the a bit of an original horror format. You know, the, the horror suits it so well; mm -hmm. it fits into that it fits into that short format so beautifully. Um, and we've sort of lost, at least in the UK, um, uh, we've lost the this sort of progression whereby you know you hone your craft on short stories and then you pro pro progress to novels. It's not really the way things happen anymore. It seems a bit of a shame, really, because that I mean. Think about the first short story I ever read was The Monkey's Paw by W.W. W. Jacobs, <laughs> which is still terrifying. Mm -hmm. I, I read it the other day again because I had to discuss it for a podcast, and I was like, this is, they let children read this? Really? Like, this This is terrible. Um, and it, it was the first, yeah, it was the first short story I'd, 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 I'd ever read. And I remember after, because I get night terrors, I remember thinking when I first read it, I think this is where you put it. This is how you cage the monster with the, the words, you know. I, you know, it's funny because in the estates, I think we still go through that progression, as far as I can tell. Not yeah. all, but a lot of writers do. Most horror writers do start off writing short stories still, and then do a novel. I'm, I, I didn't it's a, realize that in England. I think it's a great. I think it's a great. It's a. It's a great. Um, it's a great sort of like honing of your craft, and I, I, I wish, I wish there were a more fertile ground for short stories here, um, so that people could could do that. But it just, it doesn't. It seems to have, it seems to have. You can sell out. them in America with the internet. You can sell them anywhere. There you go. Well, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're not stuck with England just selling these things. <laughs> Very true. Well, much as Britain is, uh, you know, trying to follow in America's footsteps, Kat, as you were saying earlier, you know, the past few years have taught us that that none of us are islands. I think that, you know, unfortunately, yeah. the UK has not learned that lesson <laughs> on the whole. I mean, um, almost the opposite. Yeah. An island, but, yeah. Um, Sad, but isn't retain, it? Yeah. I would, yeah. But Joy Tang, given that your focus is on short horror right now, I would love to hear you know, what you can tell us about Chinese uh, writers and, you know, are they starting in short fiction and moving on to longer form? What does that marketplace look like? Um, for Chinese, um, for China is kind of different um, because um, a lot of new literature, avant-garde and kind of frontier literature in, you know, the modern, in the modern sense started with journals. So a lot of writer a lot of writers in many genres work worked with a short story form and and then they were serializing this in magazines and journals and to a large extent it's still the case um, for example sci-fi still get um it's very it's very much um flourishing going through a kind of golden age in the short story format um and then um for the horror stories um, I actually had a little bit of trouble um, finding short stories in the in the at, at the beginning because the the writers either wrote really long <laughs> novels, kind of several volumes, or just at least one volume, or they wrote really really short, tiny stories. Um, so it took a bit of digging to um, find. Uh, some short stories that, that were a bit longer and some novelettes. Uh, so for it's, I think that um, the horror genre really, the, the short story form kind of quite suits the horror genre in that you can have kind of 
the beginning and the kind of development and then the point where the characters pass the point of no return and then kind of a culmination in the end, it works very well as a short form. Um, so, um, in my collection, so after after some digging around and after some um, a lot of searching, I did manage to find so a, a collection, a really wide range of um, horror fiction in short form, um, and. It's interesting, what, going back to what we were discussing before, a lot of writers are blending genres. So I'm getting, so I have a, a sci-fi that, a sci-fi story that has horror element, or I have um, some thrillers or suspense fiction that has a horror element. There are some more traditional horrors, ghost stories, and then there's um, kind of survival horror. Um, there's also folk horror. So there's all kinds. Um, so it's very, so, I mean, I could go on forever, but <laughs> I, um, Emily, does that, should I go on or? Oh, I think Emily's muted. Is that right? Oh, mm. yes. I muted myself and then I, promptly forgot. Um, no, that's, uh, that's wonderful. And that's fascinating. And I think that, you know, short fiction as a showcase for new writers can be so wonderful. And obviously, you know, Ellen and, and Gabino also do a lot of sort of anthologizing. Um, but I think in terms of, especially when you're bringing those stories to English language readers, that's, it's it's almost like a sampler platter of okay i'm i'm encountering this this you know this new mode for the first time and i'm going to get a little bit of everything and figure out what i really like and i think going back to what we were talking about earlier and trying to figure out how to introduce horror to non-horror readers which i personally don't really think exist i think everyone reads horror even if they don't think they do yeah, um I think that's right i think that can be a useful tool yeah. I love the whole idea of hybrid because I think as somebody who, as a scholar, I, you know, by training in some ways, you know, I think what we're now seeing as hybrid is just all of us getting more, oh, these are, these are what define these categories. These are what define these genres and these conventions. And I think because we, we have these conversations, now we see things as hybrid. But I think that Gabina, for example, is right, right? It's, for example, crime and horror, just a natural fit. They both deal with dark subject matter. I think crime in some ways allows for construction of a plot and that allows for an unfolding mystery, which in many ways is part of horror. So I just, I, I think, I find that, I, I just find that interesting. I think a lot of the people Ellen mentioned are obviously seen as literary. Um, so I, I wonder sometimes if it's a hybrid thing going on or if we're just, um, figuring out you know what we think these things are and then of course they break apart and they change and we all do it differently but there's, well, there's also, a wonderful oh sorry. Oh, sorry i would say a lot of it's such marketing i mean in the in the 80 i guess it was the 90s well a lot of mainstream writers started writing um serial killer novels would i i consider if they're dark enough that they're horror and they some of them were terrific um but they were not published as horror novels you know i mean even uh you know, Silence of the Lambs was not published yeah. as a horror novel. It's a definitely, it won the World Fantasy Award, I think. And, I mean, it's a horror novel for Christ's sake. Um, so that's interesting that the mainstream might embrace it, but what doesn't want to call it horror. And sometimes I guess they're calling more things horror now, but there's still crime and psychological material is definitely overlaps with horror and should be, or can be considered horror. So there's almost there's there's a never ending platter. Science fiction horror is a is a is a traditional sub sub horror. You know, it's a it's something that has been in horror forever. 
uh, Lenin versus the ants, uh, who goes there, which became the thing. Mm. Um, you know, it's a lot of Harlan Ellison's work is science fiction horror. So yes, blending has always been there. And a lot of what it's called depends on what the publishers want to call it because they think it'll sell to a particular group. Having worked in marketing at uh, various publishers, I can confirm. <laughs> but honestly, I think. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. Like, like, hmm? You, you sorry. didn't want to. Um, I was, I was going to say, um, there's that wonderful description of horror or the gothic as being, it's not a genre in itself, but it's like a parasite that attaches itself to genre mm. and evolves through time. And I think that's a, that, I mean, I like the horror idea of a parasite anyway, but, but also um, I think it's a useful way to think of it because it just reinforces that idea that horror is in everything really. Um, mm -hmm. It's in everything we write and everything we do and everything we live, you know, um, it's, um, uh, it, it's it it can be just a matter of shelving i, I do i do it's not that simple uh, in with as with every question to do with books it's a bit like sort of ish a little bit maybe on some days you know but uh, horror, horror is both a very very useful way of talking about uh, of shelving or, or categorizing things and also you know also doesn't quite describe it does it so i you know, i like the parasite the parasite image i, I do I've, take, I've always I do. found myself Go ahead, please. I do take quite a broad approach to horror. And as far as I'm concerned, all the stories I've picked or uh, I'm, I'm working with are horror stories, but then my editor has slightly different views. Um, you know, they say, um, well, this is more traditional, this is pure, and the other one is kind of something else, horror and something else. But that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Something else. Are these all? Um, are these are are they contemporary writers in China, or are they? Yes, they are contemporary writers about three generations from. Um, kind of, the range goes over the last thirty years. Um, okay. the three generations. I find myself I returning to the, uh, you know, U.S. Supreme Court decision on pornography, which is, uh, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. I know when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Quite. So if people have read Dead Silence so by S.A. Barnes, it is absolutely something that fits um, these two traditions because it's absolutely science fiction. It takes place in the future, in space, there's technology. But there are extreme and like, you know, moments of horror. And um, I, I love things like that that are successful. It's not just like abstractly like, oh, isn't it all? That really is. Um, and there's also, God, I'm trying to remember her name. Um, hmm, she, no, I'm not going to remember, but she's like a fantasy horror. She does alternate worlds. And it's very successful in those regards. Like it does all the things and really, really well. Not just an abstract definition. It does it. So I love seeing that stuff. I love Dead Silence. And not to mention that it's just like beautifully, pristinely written. So yeah, that is a wonderful book. Well, we've talked about trends quite a bit so far and about, you know, sort of genre definitions. What I would love to know from all of you is if you were given a magic wand and total authority over the horror world, what would what changes would you implement day one? What would you get rid of? What would you add in? What like harder fast rules? You know, what do you want to see from the genre next? Pat, you looked up. Should we start with you? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was me hoping someone else would go first. No, Gabino, Gabino started. So Gabino, let's no, I, just, from you. I, I was going to say you just want to get us in trouble, which is fine. I'll play. Um, <laughs> um, I, I don't think we should do lo the, the hard 100% always applies rule, but uh, I would say you would have to go through some type of vetting process before you write, uh, I mean, trigger warning, before you write rape stories as horror. Right. I'm sick right. and tired of that being used as, hey, this is something that makes people very uncomfortable. The reason it makes everybody uncomfortable right. is because it happens every day and it's absolutely horrendous next to killing somebody. That's probably the worst thing you can do to them. So stop using it as a prop 
to shock people. So the, the first, move, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah, first yeah. move with the wand would be like, no, there's a vetting yeah. process now. Um, I don't have a problem with a rape story when I read it and it destroys my heart as a, as you know, nonfiction, someone working through their experiences or trying to, you know, uh, uh, use uh, their not creative nonfiction as some kind of, uh, some kind of healing process, that's all you. But uh, when I see it as, I don't have a story to tell, but if I throw this in there, people will talk about it, uh, then right. um, Shazam or whatever we're doing, you're out. Um, I'd start there. <laughs> I obviously agree. I, like I said before, predatory behavior is just intolerable um, for me in any way. Um, I would also, if I could wave a magic wand, I would make it so there, I think this sounds like easy on the face of it and everyone said it, like I would eliminate tokenism because I would, what mm -hmm. I would do is I would make every single small to big process and <clears throat> I would, every single judge of every single ward, I would make those demographics look identical to the demographics of the United States. So it wasn't like, you know, you know, okay, we'll throw on one Indian. You know what I mean? Or this year we'll try too. I wonder what that'll look like. Um, because I think if you have a lot of people, you know, if, if <laughs> I think the writing will change in the, for the better, if the basis of power change for the better. So I would give money. Uh, I would give, I would, I would have um, the horror prizes be hugely funded um, with huge publicity and huge outreach and make them something that is an event in the literary calendar. Um, because horror is a serious business. It's a serious, it, it deals with serious um, emotions and it has a whole host of amazing writers. Um, and at the moment, not, that's not fair. At the moment, <laughs> horror is thriving. It always has been, but there's something, there's something about putting a whole pile of money behind a prize. Mm -hmm. That may, that really incentivizes people and makes you take it seriously. So that's that's probably one thing. I and you'd have like a, in the in my in my fantasy prize, you'd have like all sorts of different like categories and things you could and and um and opportunities for uh, all sorts of for everyone to in, inclusive opportunities for everyone to to compete and enter. But I think I don't know. I just feel like it's time. I only just thought of this, but <laughs> I feel like it's time for you know maybe a. You know, like everyone to take horror a little more seriously. I don't know. Well, jumping off from the money thing, I would like if I had a magic wand, I'd I'd get let every I would get every genre magazine enough money so they could pay their writers well. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, the more they pay, they pay. Yeah. yeah, it's a dream. It's what can you say? Yeah. I think the first thing I'd do is to. Um, make it so that the uh, the horror isn't a discouraged genre in China because at the moment it is. Um, during the flourishing in the 20, at the beginning of the 21st century, there were lots of um, kind of Ouija board horrors of summoning uh, spirits, souls. And then there's been some kind of real life incidents of, of deaths. And unfortunately then there was a census ship and writers were discouraged to write in that genre and now which is why I had such difficulty finding stories in the first place um, they were discouraged to write it um, writing the genre by the by the state and at the, as a result some people have stopped writing some unfortunately fortunately we have online literature now and that's developing very well and um, the censorship does not work as well in work as well online. So people can writers can still publish online and have their readership there. And so some, but a lot of writers are kind of not really keen to say that their writing is horror. They'll say, "Oh, I'm writing suspense" or "I'm writing thriller," but actually, there is a strong element in what they're writing. Um, I think partly part of the problem is that the Chinese word for horror is kongbu, xiaoshuo, which is the same for the, the word for terrorism. And so there is this kind of negative stigma attached to it. And I, I would prefer to use the word 
Jing Song, which is um, shock and thrilling, shock, shock and fear, a uh, shock and thrilling fiction. Um, so that's one of the first things I would do is um, for horror to be kind of not a genre that's looked down on, um, for it to be seen as a more valid genre, um, because maybe more like sci-fi where it's receiving a lot of um, uh, funding and support at the moment, um, because it is as important to um, explore people's dreams. You know, it is important to explore people's fears as well as people's dreams. In sci-fi, it tends to be dreams and fears, more dreams and horror, it's the fears. It's equally important and valid. Yeah, and I wonder if, you know, I mean, there, there are sort of two strands here, one of which is that for, you know, to, to paraphrase Silvia Moreno-Garcia, who has said this so much more eloquently than I'm about to, you know, we had a long fallow period in America where horror was a dirty word if your last name wasn't King. And so everything got sort of tucked into other genres. Oh, it's a thriller, it's suspense, much like what you're talking about now. But I wonder if Chinese horror needs a breakout sort of along the same lines as, you know, the three body problem, something that mm. plants its flag and says, no, this is this is a mode of storytelling that that resonates and we're gonna keep with it. Yes, yeah, something something like that that brings it into um the discourse of key um kind of a kind of into a more key position as in the in literature um i'm hoping to maybe help with that by mm -hmm. bringing out voices of horror writers outside yeah. of china and hopefully that can feed back into the domestic readership mm. that sci-fi has actually i hope that does work i mean the thing is when i i was in china about I don't know, 10 years ago or maybe more or less. I'm not sure. But at the time, before the three body problem came out and became a real hit, before that, we were told that, I mean, there were Chinese publishers we met with, and they said that Chinese science fiction is extremely popular with kids. And then at a certain age, no one reads it. And so um. obviously something <laughs> happened. No, seriously, that's what we were told by the publishers. So things mm. changed. And I, maybe because of the three body problem, because that became so famous for whatever reason. And I'm really, so if that can happen, then hopefully it can happen with horror also. You need something to break out of the, you know, it's like, yes, this is horror and we embrace it. Yes, um, that's, with a, it's with sci-fi, it definitely was the three body problem. Even now, I mean, a few years ago, I've written in my intro in Synopticon that when I went to China and I always go to the bookshop, when I go to China, I always go to the bookshops to look at what's what's coming out, what's selling well. And I had to ask the assistant where the, where the science fiction was because she thought I was, I was asking for textbooks, <laughs> science textbooks. And then when I mentioned three body problem, she says, Ah, oh, why didn't you say so before? And then I I, I got taken to the sci-fi section where you know it's one shelf, um, or, along with the other science fiction writers and three body. So definitely, there are writers that I think who have a very really popular readership in China horror writers, uh, like Tai Jun, for example, um, who I'm featuring um, in my translations who have this resonance with people, um, with readers who kind of appears to be more literary um, and also has been published a little in the, um, in English as, in, as a literary writer, but who definitely works in the genre, in, who definitely loves kind of zombies, ghosts, the undead, and writes writes in the horror genre too. So you could do with someone like that. They we do have some writers that write horror that are published in English, but not 
their horror works, it tends to be their mm -hmm. other types of fiction. So maybe there'll well, be some yeah. yeah, who'll win the well, Hugo. Jump <laughs> well, jumping off from that, um, I do wanna just take an aside to our viewers uh, for a moment. We will be leaving some time for uh, questions at the end of the panel. So if you have any, please drop those in the comments. We'll come back to them. Uh, but jumping off from that, Choi Ting, I want to know from all of you, who is a horror author or creator who is not on this panel, uh, who you think is doing really interesting, groundbreaking, innovative, or just plain cool work in the space? Do they have to be new okay. writers? <laughs> they don't. <laughs> Whoever you want to name. Nathan Ballingrud. And I'm looking forward to his first novel, which is science fiction, but I assume it's going to be dark. And um, actually, Tor.com just bought a novella by him called Crypt of the Moon, the Moon Spiders that I have acquired and will be editing, which is horror. And um, he's been doing short work for years, really good, excellent short stories. And so I'm really looking forward to the new novel, The Strange. Yeah. I love my more direct peers, like, I, you know, so cool to have Gabino and Cynthia and B. Castro, Stephen Graham Jones, Sylvia Moreno Garcia in some ways like kickstarted me. I'm going to say something really conventional and I'm going to talk about a straight white dude, um, which is um, Brady Hendricks. I just love what he does. I love, I think he's fun. I think he's smart. I like the way he, um, I think he's quirky. I think um, he's genuinely scary. And like in my favorite, um, you know, the book club's guide to slaying vampires. Southern Book Club's Guide to Saying Vampires, what I love about it is you've got white female characters who you are so rageful for because they're the men in their lives are willing to accept insanity rather than, you know, some of their wives. And at the same time, you also have these women being accountable to the black women in their community too. And I just, I don't know, I want to see, I want to see more dudes um, do that. So more straight white dudes do that. And he's fun, he's just fun to read. I think there's a um, huge amount of talent to choose from really. Uh, uh, Paul Tremblay, always. Um, uh, there's a writer called Virginia Fato who wrote a novel called Mrs. March, which everyone classifies as, as literary. It's not, it's horror, <laughs> it just is. Um, and it's absolutely wonderful. It, it gave me writer's envy. It made me jealous of, um, of, of I, I wish I'd I wish I'd written that book, basically. Um and it was absolutely wonderful. Kelly Link, always amazing. Um her world makes this world seem unreal. Um it's it's so convincing and and, and, and strange and extraordinary. Um I like Gray I love Grady too. St and Stephen Graham Jones, always. Um I think we've got a um, I think we've got we've got a, we've got a rich we've got sort of quite a rich sort of like um, array to draw from. Yeah, I think two uh, two writers that are going to have uh, an incredible twenty twenty three are um, Haley Piper and uh, Eric Larocca. Yes. Uh, they're both amazing. They both came out of uh, really small indie presses okay. and then uh, exploded because they deserved to explode. And uh, both of them have more than one book coming this year, which is like, yes. Uh, so Haley and, and Eric, uh, yeah, they're doing really cool stuff. I just thought of one more, Annie Wilkes, All White Spaces. Mm -hmm. Loved that book, loved that yeah. book. Yeah. I can't, you know, Cassandra Kaur, their novels are yes. terrific. We've got a new novella coming out, The Salt Goes Heavy, which is about really vicious mermaids, a vicious mermaid and uh, plague doctors. And uh, yeah, their stuff is really interesting. Yeah. And they've got a novel with Richard Cadry coming this fall as well. So they're another yeah. with multiple books coming this year. Right, yeah, yeah. And S.L. Coney's um, Wild Spaces, which is another novella coming out of tour.com, um, which has been described as um, Rick McCammon's Boy's Life mixed with Lovecraft, which is a good description. And that'll be out. Yeah. 
personally, Erica mentioned Shane Hawk earlier, and I'm really excited for Shane's anthology coming this fall, uh, Never, Never Whistle at Night, which is an anthology of indigenous dark horror um, that I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm like bouncing up and down for that one. It's a great title as well. Right? Yeah. Yeah, actually Paul Tremblay's got a, a collection coming out also. Um, the Beast oh, You he... Are, which sounds good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, he's wonderful. He never, never disappoints. Yeah. Well, I would also love to hear from each of you, you know, what's next for you? What What do you have coming up next? Anything you can tell us about your projects in progress? You know, Zhui Ting, I know we know about uh, Sinophagia, but if you have any other projects you'd like to tell us about, you know, I know we would love to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a book coming out in May uh, called Chinese Myths, a non-fiction book about China, all about Chinese mythology. Uh, and then sign I'm currently finishing off the translations for Sinophagia. It features 14 different writers, uh, contemporary horror writers um, of all uh, from all over China, different um, genders, ethnicities, uh, and covers the last three generations over 30 years. Um, so with established writers and new voices who are well known and also very new writers. Uh, and that's coming out in uh, spring 2024. Um, yeah, I'm also working on new nonfiction, but I can't really say much about that yet. I'm Kat, finishing. How about you? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm finishing up the um, best horror of the year, number fifteen. Um, God knows when I'll be done with it, but it'll be coming out. Not, I guess December probably. I don't know. Um, I'm working. I'm working on a an anthology, another anthology for Titan called Christmas and Other Horrors, um, which is all original. <laughs> I was worried about the title. I thought they someone might be offended, but my editor loved it. So it's like, <laughs> and, yep, <It's> great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and yeah. So far, I have some. I have stories by Alma Katsu and Tanana Reeve Du, and um, Richard Cadry, and Benjamin mm -hmm. Percy, and a bunch of other people, and more stories coming in. I hope. And then I'm also doing a, a reprint anthology for Tachyon, that was originally it's was going to be it's all reprint it's supposed to be called fear which is psychological horror it may not end up with that title i forget why then may think it's too general or something and maybe it'll be dread i don't know but it's going to be um all reprints and i'm looking for reprints by the way mm -hmm. things that um are fearful you know psychological basically um, and that's what i'm working on Aside from the novellas and short stories for tour.com. And all the rest. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got, look, uh, got Looking Glass Sound, my next one, my next novel coming out ne uh, this year. Um, in the States, it comes out in August from Tour Nightfire. Uh, in the UK, uh, it comes out in April. Um, uh, I bled on the page for this one. It was very um, it was written, sort of, I, I don't know, during a difficult time in my life. Um, my partner was um, uh, bravely ill when I was writing it. So I, it, and, and it makes its way into the book, doesn't it? It just does. You can't help it, really. Um, and it's also, I think, the most high, ambitious thing I've written in a while, probably since Needless Street. So... <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> um, but yeah, looking glass sound. Oh, I guess that's me. Uh, a that's bunch you. of short stories. And uh, I sent in the next novel. So it's done. But uh, now we have to make it good. Because when you get it done, it's not good. Uh, so, it's <laughs> so there's a thing that I turned in. And now we'll, we'll work. Uh, for a couple months, I'm um, actually making it something that deserves to be out in the world. So I'm going to be panicking and pounding coffee for that for the next couple months. Um, I I wanted to also say how much I've known Ben Percy for years. And I just, I think 
he's phenomenal, just a phenomenal guy too. And congrats to those who are long listed for the Stoker. That's exciting. I wanted to say that too. I'd forgotten to say that earlier. What I'm working on, I am in uh, Never Whistle at Night. Um, I've got a cool story in there. Um, and then I am about to sign a contract that essentially is on spec or flat iron, and but it's halfway done anyway because I am kind of a compulsive writer. But it's called Room 904, and it's essentially about a woman who um, she was getting her PhD in psychology, and her sister and her mother always have had these sort of psychic gifts where they could hear and see the dead kind of faintly. Um, but her sister has this history with drug abuse and being in a cult. And when she's graduating the night of her her graduation with her PhD, her sister is like, you need to come to the Brown Palace right now. And she laughs and she's like, just come join me. I'm drunk. It's my graduation. No. So the sister suicides appears to the main character. And then um, ever after that, her powers are turned on, if you will. And they're just wildly turned on. And she ends up kind of destroying her academic career and becoming a paranormal psychologist um, or paranormal investigator, rather. <laughs> And so eventually she's called to the Brown Palace to solve a paranormal um, murder, series of murders. Um, but her sister is actually somehow haunting the Brown Palace. And then at one point, since all these women check into the Brown Palace murdered within, or they die or suicide or murder, they don't know, within three weeks, um, she doesn't want to do it because of her sister dying there. And then her mother checks, so she decides she has to do it. So there's my little very long form pitch to what I'm working on. I love it. I love it. And especially as someone who spends a decent amount of time in Denver to see family, I love to see that, you know, that sense of place that I really loved in Whitehorse coming back with the Brown Palace, um, which is, oh, if, you, if any of you are ever in Denver, it's worth stopping in just to take a look at it because it's beautiful. Um, thank you all for that. I would love to hear, just as we're starting to wrap up, uh, I would love to hear if you could give one piece of advice to a younger version of yourself, maybe when you were just starting out writing or when you were just stepping your foot into the horror world, what you would, what advice you would give yourself, whether that's, you know, words of encouragement or gentle redirection or, you know, a stern, you know, reprimand. Uh, I would love to know what you would tell the baby version of you. Uh, this what? this can be a lot of fun. It can be a job. It can be a lot of things. The one thing that it is always going to be is a war of attrition. So keep at it. <laughs> I started out in book publishing and not getting anywhere for a long time as an editorial assistant. And I started in si first mainstream in book publishing and then science fiction. Um, and from the, at the very beginning, I did something really stupid. I did not accept, when I was unemployed, someone offered me an interview. I mean, not an interview, because I knew the guy said, the publisher, the editor said there was no job, but he would talk to me and would I come in, you know, did I want to come in? And I actually, and I actually said no. And I met him years later and I said, I'm so sorry, I'm such an idiot. <laughs> Basically, if someone wants to talk to you, even if they don't have a job for you, I mean, I know this isn't really for writers as much, but if you have an opportunity, if someone offers you an opportunity and they seem genuine, they're not like being predatory or anything, take the fucking opportunity and say yes. Because <laughs> you never know where it's going to lead. <laughs> you're muted. Cat, you're muted. God damn it. Okay. Um, I think that's exactly right. But I also, I also think that what can and should go hand in hand with that is don't be grateful, you know. Um, don't be so uh, don't be so grateful that you lose the, the the sense of your worth because there's certainly a there's a temptation in this industry to feel um, you're just you've been trying so hard and for so long to get any kind of traction that the moment anyone gives you an, an in, you just take it with both hands, like whether that's an agent representation or, or, or publisher, or what, whatever. Um, I think stop and stop and think and assess. Take all the opportunities, as, 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 as Alan was saying, like um, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with going to take the meeting, but I think there's, I think there's a real, um, there's, there's a, re a really, uh, 
critical point at which you have to just believe in your in you have to believe in your worth as 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 a as a, as a writer and as a person. Um, and uh, I think it can be easy, very easy for young new writers to feel overwhelmingly grateful. So don't feel too grateful. Um, I'll go. I I think um, number one, literary isn't a genre. It's a series of conventions, and they can be applied to any genre. Um, and I, you know, you're allowed to read and write what you really love and enjoy. Um, it's also good to read extremely widely. Also, you know, I would say really don't don't listen to the patently literary folks um, about how structure doesn't matter and story doesn't matter and plot doesn't matter and all those things don't matter and actually read all the books that are like on a for a dollar on Amazon on structure that the supposedly commercial writers read because they they know what they're talking about a lot better than people who are like I don't know I love language we all love language we all love <laughs> hands up who loves language <laughs> Shweeting, how about you? Yep. Uh, so I've always loved, I've loved like stories with monsters and ghosts since I was a child. Actually, I read a lot of them when I was a child and then I kind of forgot about them for a period of time. And when I was a teenager, I read a lot of um, uh, fiction from the literary canon, um, kind of serious <laughs> um, fiction. Um, so I'd probably go back in time to the me then um, as in a teenager or a fresh graduate and say, remember those ghost stories you liked, uh, read more of them, make notes, <laughs> um, read more into the tradition because one day you're gonna be bringing, helping to bring that tradition across the seas um, when you remember how awesome um, sci-fi horror and um, fantasy is. I think that's lovely. I, lo I, I, I just, I love hearing from such an accomplished and wide ranging, you know, group of, of authors and editors who have wonderful insights to offer. And I think, you know, as we are wrapping up, I want to tempt you all to get into trouble just a little bit more. Um, if there were one trope, one horror trope, that you could do away with forever. Uh, you know, with the caveat that there's always somebody who is gonna come in and rein reinvent the trope and do it well. If there was one trope you could do away with, what would it be? An unhappy couple yeah. going into a cottage or a, a, an isolated place and things go bad. I know yes. that's in general, but it seemed like every English novel for a while was like that or story. It's like, stop it. <laughs> Mine is women falling down when they run. Oh. <laughs> I've never known a woman actually fall down in my actual experience when she runs. And yet, every time you see it, on she goes and down she falls. Let's just use it. That's clumsy woman erasure and I, for one, will not stand for it. <laughs> I think so you've won this panel, Emily. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I would you've say, got something to say. <laughs> uh, I don't know. This was this was a thing. Uh, okay, so here we go. Don't hate me for this one. Uh, loving, careful, intelligent, educated parents uh, keeping their kids in uh, shockingly haunted houses where the walls are bleeding and knives are flying. Because if you know any parents, you know they would just grab their kids and run. So uh, no, no more perfect white families with 2.5 children staying in awful haunted houses. Okay. Actually, should we talk about America? Because I have nothing I can say beyond like, hilariously weak characters that are women, right? That are just there as props, I suppose, not really abstract. But actually I've thought about that a lot because I love haunted houses. And I know a lot of people have been like, enough haunted houses. And I'm like, more, more haunted houses. And I think about that a lot. That's why they always have this hilarious caveat, like it will follow you wherever you go. Or we're homeless and we have 10 children. I just love those ridiculous caveats. And because 
it allows me to do exactly what I want, which is stay in the house. <laughs> I hate women as doormats, but that's throughout fiction. I mean, I just like, oh, please leave the guy or kill him, please. <laughs> Let's get it over Either or, it. really. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I suggest muted. Even <laughs> More stabbing. There's also, um, go back to sort of dovetailing off what Gabina was saying, like that there is definitely this sort of um, hierarchy of who's suitable to be sexually assaulted in film and TV. So named characters almost get sexually assaulted and they get saved by someone. But you have this whole hurry, like ho this isn't a necessarily a strictly a horror thing, but it's it certainly factors in. It's this thing of, you know, um, if you do get sexually assaulted, it's because you weren't important enough. <laughs> um, if you get raped, it's because you weren't important enough. You didn't have, you're not a named character. I think Same there's a lot. If you get murdered too. Right, exactly, and I, I, yeah, maybe that maybe there's there's a case to be made for getting rid of the un, this unnamed army of deceased and sexually assaulted women. I don't know. The red right, shirt, the, uh, the army of the fridged. Right. <laughs> the um, for me, I think it's uh, I think it would be balconies uh, in terms of Chinese horror, not because I don't like it, not because I don't like. The featuring of balconies but it's i'm finding it's like the chekhov's gun if the story mentions a balcony that you can get to someone goes something off it. happens <laughs> <laughs> some, some <laughs> dies from it or jumps off it or i would right. like to be ple pleasantly surprised i would like to be surprised and have the mentioning of a balcony that is accessible that isn't because <laughs> Fair Bottom. enough. Fair enough. That seems like what did balconies point. ever do wrong anyway? <laughs> Nothing. I love the lovely architectural feature. I know. I love the callback. Mm -hmm. Somebody who like was trained by literary people who were like, I just put pretty words on the page. That's what I do. Oh, but I'm a genius. Big idea. Big idea. I love these little tricks. I love like red herrings in the callback where I'm like, that was the that was the machete that appeared earlier and then they used it for this purpose. Oh my God, I guess I like the cheap thrills. You know, I love these, these, these things that I admire that I had no idea were actually really hard to write. So, but it doesn't have to be a balcony. It can be a movie. You are all just wonderful and I could certainly do this all day, but I, I do know that the, the convention has other panels, I guess that's a thing. Um, <laughs> So um, if anyone has any final words of wisdom, we would you know, be happy to hear them. But if not, I think we'll start to wrap up. And uh, immense thanks again to Adrian and, uh, and the team. And thank you to everyone who took time out of their Monday afternoon to join us to talk about, you know, how horror really doesn't exist, but also exists everywhere, um, I think is where we landed on that. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for everything. Yeah. Thank you for your wonderful wrangling. Thank you. <laughs> all right. And I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. You too. You too. Thank you. Bye. Cheers.